All right. Well, uh, welcome to session two. Here you are. Okay. So, uh, session one, we defined worldview, right? Uh, you've got that on your previous handout as our first principles and all that follow from it. How we ought to live, how we should see the world. So, we want a biblical worldview. And in order to get there, we need to think about what is the central message of the Bible. And the central message of the Bible is the gospel. So we need to define it, but I want to give it to you in terms that will help you use it as a worldview itself. I mean, it, it is because it is the central message of the Bible. It is the center of a biblical worldview. It is not all that goes into a biblical worldview, because the Bible talks about lots of different things, and not all of them are the gospel itself, but all of them are related to the gospel itself. And so we need to understand this very carefully. So grab your Bibles, open them to Colossians chapter 1. That's where we'll be at for the entirety of uh, this session. I know we, we were flipping around a lot last session just to try to give ourselves uh, categories. Uh, Colossians is a, a letter of Paul, so it's in your New Testament, near the back end of that. Um, it's one of the shorter epistles. You might flip past it a few times because, you know, the pages stick together, all that. So I'll give you a second to get there. Um, this is probably my favorite section of Scripture. So, one of Josh's favorite, favorite Bible verse, right here. Colossians 1, 13 to 23 is what we'll be looking at. And the reason why I love this section of Scripture so much is because it is, I think, uh, one of the clearest presentations of this idea. And what I'm calling it is the gospel and the house in which it lives. And so that's what we're, we're going to be talking about is that the, the gospel itself, we'll get a definition there, and then the house in which it lives is kind of the, the imagery we were using earlier from Matthew 7 of obeying all that Jesus said and then building your house on this rock. Uh, this is kind of the same idea, except the, the, the house is all of the rest of the Bible and all of the rest of the world and history and everything in it uh, and, and we're going to look at what the Bible says about that and then how the gospel adorns that house. Because that house would be true and real in and of itself. And some people believe in the house and they don't believe the gospel. And that will be more clear as, as we move forward. Actually, it will be real clear right now. So, uh, Petrus Van Maastricht again. Uh, I'm quoting from him again. Here he says, How shameful it is to know other things but to be ignorant of ourself and our own faith upon which all things depend. And that faith is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that is upon which all things depend. And I think he means this not just in, in terms of your salvation and your eternity, but in terms of things like gravity and math and logic and, and all of those truths those depend upon our own faith, uh, the, 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 the subject of faith, Jesus Christ. So, I heard something interesting today, and this isn't in the notes because I heard it today. <laughs> I did the notes a while ago for this session. Um, there's a famous atheist named Richard Dawkins. Have you ever heard of him? Good one, good one. That was good, that was good. I like that. That's a good kind of heckling. Keep doing that to me. Keeps me on my toes. I had to think about what you said for a second. Uh, anyway, um, so Richard Dawkins, he said just now. <laughs> That's good. Um, so Richard Dawkins, this famous atheist, back in my day, uh, when I was in high school, a, a friend of mine handed me his book called The God Delusion. And he wanted me to read it because I said I was a Christian and my friend said he was an atheist. And, and so he was trying to evangelize me and handed me his holy book, so to speak. And I never read it. It sat in my backpack for months and I eventually just handed it back to him. I never got around to it. 
I read it now. I didn't read it then. I read it later after I had become a Christian. But Josh, you just said that you were saying you were a Christian. Yes, I was saying that, but I wasn't one. And, and Dawkins is now saying the same thing, basically, which is interesting. So he started this entire movement against belief in God, and now he's saying, but wait, cultural Christianity is good. Now, a cultural Christian would be one who says they're a Christian, maybe adopts some Christian values and morals, but doesn't believe in the house or the gospel in it, so to speak. They got pieces of the house. They have some of the bricks, and they lay them out, and they think that will protect them from the elements outside. And so they grab, you know, don't murder, be nice to my neighbor, love is good and a virtue, and they try to create a house out of this. But it's not enough bricks. They don't have the, the, the materials that bind them together either. And then they're missing that which adorns the house on the inside, the gospel. And so Richard Dawkins has been saying recently, you know what? I'd rather have everybody at least, you know, they're, even though they're wrong about Christianity being true, it's better that we all believe in it anyway. Because it makes a better society or something. Which ironically militates against his evolutionary views, which we'll cover in a later session. But I thought this was interesting because that is the last thing that I want, is cultural Christianity. Not that, I want Christian culture, but not cultural Christianity. I want there to be a culture that is Christian because it's full of Christians, actual ones, and not a Christian who is one just because that is what everyone else is doing. And that is what we must avoid. That's what this Maastricht quote is about, that if you are just following along with a cultural Christianity, because it's where you were born or where, what you were raised in, and you don't understand it, you are ignorant of its substance, the faith upon which all things depend, then this session is for you. <laughs> um, and if that's not you, good. Then this session is for your friends who are like that. Because you, there will be. There always will be cultural Christians within broader Christianity. There will be cultural Christians at your church. There will always be, that will always be the case. And you only know, between you and the Lord, whether that's you. Um, so when thinking about these worldview issues, we have to first begin with developing our own before we move on to critique others. So a lot of the sessions later, we're going to be engaging in critiques of these other positions. But we need to start developing our own because we don't get caught on the back foot. We can't subject others to criticism and not be willing to take it ourselves. Um, so we need to be ready for someone to fire back if, if, if we engage in a critique of their worldview. So we need to develop our own. It's a difficult process. might involve a good deal of, of angst and, and even frustration and difficulty. Ecclesiastes 118 is helpful here. It tells us, you don't need to flip there. Um, you can say in Colossians. But it says, in, in much wisdom, there is much grief. And increasing knowledge results in increasing pain. And, and this is true. When you're five and your whole world consists of dino nuggies and running around in the front yard or, you know, kicking a ball around, the world is pretty pleasant until you scrape your knee and <laughs> uh, there you go. But... Um, as you get older and you start to understand that there are hurts that run deeper than scraped knees. Um, there are things that hurt, not just in the body, but in the soul. You begin to understand that um, some pains don't heal overnight, basically. Um, you grow in that kind of knowledge of the world that increases your pain. As you understand that there are big questions that are hard to answer, you might become frustrated or uh, it might disturb you. But... That's where scripture comes in, and it provides us wisdom to navigate those things. So, what is the gospel? Let me read to you Colossians 1, and then we're going to walk through that text as we move through the rest of this um, in different ways. Colossians 1.13. For he, Jesus, rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. 
all things are being created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death, in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. So notice in that last verse, the hope of the gospel that you have heard, how was it heard? It was proclaimed in all creation under heaven. The gospel is, first and foremost, a, a pronouncement, a proclamation. It is good news. That's what the word means. And as one pastor puts it, it's not an election for Jesus as president. He's not going around trying to pull your votes and be like, you know what? Make, vote for me to be king of all creation and not, you know, Satan or yourself or some other guy that you might prefer. That's not what's happening with the proclamation of the gospel. Jesus is the king already. That's what we see uh, in, for example, the text that we read earlier in Matthew 28, where he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So the good news is a good announcement. It's a heralding of the king and his kingdom. And that arrival of this king is the good news of peace on earth between God and man. That that is made possible by the person and work of Jesus. In the context in which we live, we must talk about every aspect of uh, all of the, the house that gets built up around that gospel, that good news that the King Jesus has arrived to bring peace between God and man where there was once, once warfare and where there was strife and enmity, where man was at war with God and hated him, Jesus comes and provides a way of peace for those who hated their creator. But you need context for that story to be understood, for it to be intelligible. And the reason for that, imagine, has everyone seen Lord, Lord of the Rings? There's only one answer to this question. No, no, okay. Uh, Star Wars, original Star Wars? Okay, there we go. I can use this as an illustration then. Um, so imagine all you have is the end of Empire Strikes Back. And Luke is just yelling, no, with his cut off hand before he gets, you know, dropped down to Cloud City. And that's, here's the story, the whole thing, this, this is the good news, well, the bad news in that case, Luke just got very bad news, Darth Vader is his father. <laughs> um, but, but that's all you get. Or, let's say, you, you know, at the end of New Hope, where they're, they're celebrating the victory that just went over the empire, they blew up the Death Star, but all you get, the whole movie is just, the cel it cuts to the beginning of the celebration and ends at the end of the celebration. That's all you get. Would you understand what any of that meant? Would you be interested? Would you even have categories for what's happening? You wouldn't know who any of the characters are. You wouldn't know why they're celebrating. In the case of Darth Vader and Luke, you wouldn't know who the bad guy is. You don't know that, you, for all you know, Darth Vader's the good guy, and he just beat the bad guy. You don't know. And that's what often happens if we make assumptions when we're trying to share the gospel with people or even about our own understanding, is we, we introduce people to the end of the story or halfway through the story, and we don't give them the whole context. And that's what I mean by the house in which the gospel lives. It's that whole story that you have to build up around it to get to why the news is good. If you just stroll up to somebody and say, hey, Jesus is king, by the way, they don't, if they don't know who Jesus is, or if they have a conception in their mind of Jesus that is false, which is far worse than them even just being ignorant of him, then for them that might be bad news. Or there's like, okay, who cares? Doesn't have any impact on my life. 
And so you have to explain from start to finish, so to speak, where uh, the gospel fits in this larger narrative. So a meta-narrative is what we're talking about. And this is where you present a worldview as a story. Okay? So in the first session, I, I kind of explained this a little bit, that worldviews sometimes take the form of a story, the narrative that you tell yourself about yourself and the world around you. The Christian, to have a biblical meta-narrative, is telling the story to themselves and about the world around them, about themselves, uh, about themselves as well, of what the Bible says about those things. So you believe what the Bible says about you and your neighbor and all the rest of the world, which means that you need to know it. So you've got to read it and understand it. And when a worldview is presented as, as a story, it's still making propositional claims. Like when I say, you know, a propositional claim, like one plus one is two, the sky is blue, God exists, those kinds of things. When I present a meta narrative as a story, I'm still making those claims. If I say Luke is the good guy and Darth Vader is the bad guy, I'm still telling a story, but I'm making claims about them and their moral character and all of that. So telling it as a story doesn't mean that you're not telling the truth. There are true stories. Um, so this is the house that we build up that the gospel lives in. So let's walk through this text, and then we're going to walk through it uh, out of order a little bit. So keep with me in order to establish the story. So the first thing that you have to answer when you're telling a meta-narrative is why is there something rather than nothing? So it'd be kind of like if, if Star Wars just started without, you know, the, the beginning scrolling text that gives you some background, but it, if it just skips that and just starts. Well, no, that background's helpful. It tells you the setting in a galaxy far, far away. It still doesn't answer really important questions like, how did that galaxy begin to exist? Now, for us, we need to be concerned with those questions. We actually want to know the answers, and we can know them. For some, you can't know the answers to those questions. Or they have answers, but the wrong ones. For the Christian, the answer can be found in a place like Colossians 1, 15 to 17. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. It tells you something about God. It tells you something about Jesus. The firstborn of all creation Firstborn there does not mean first created. It means he with the highest status. So the firstborn son in a household has the highest status in the household. He's the heir of all that his father possesses. And he is the one when the father is, you know, delegating, he delegates authority directly to his firstborn son, things like that. So he has the highest status, not that he's created. And we know that because of the next verse. So if someone ever tries to use that text to say that Jesus is a created being or is not God, the next verse clarifies. For by him, Jesus, all things were created. No exceptions. Both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. And notice this next line. This is why this is some of my favorite stuff in the whole Bible because it just explains everything. All things have been created through him and for him. Which means that when you are telling yourself the story about yourself, are you the main character of the story? No. Jesus is. All things were not created for you. You're not the main character. Jesus is. All things were created for him. It doesn't mean that you're not important and not important to God, but it means that the world doesn't revolve around you. It revolves around Jesus. It's made for him and not for you. And so this gives us the answer to the question, why is there something rather than nothing? Because God created all things for Jesus. It is a gift from the Father to his Son. All that exists. The Father loved the Son and gave himself the world and then gave his Son for the world. And that's the part where the good news comes in. But second, what is that history and universe that was all made for Jesus? What is it like? What is the stuff in it? And this is where we get into what is often, uh, the, the schema is often used to walk someone through the gospel. Creation, fall, redemption, and restoration or new creation. 
So creation, we get Genesis 1.1. This is foundational to everything. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Notice the parallel between that and verse 16. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth. Paul there is identifying Jesus with the God of Genesis 1.1. For by Jesus all things were created. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning God created. And so he's saying, this is the God of Genesis 1. And if God made everything, that gives us so much information about our worldview, about how we should see the world around us. If God made everything, then that means that everything and God are different. So when it says that he is the image of the invisible God, well, like, well how can God be invisible? Does he have a cloaking device? Does he have magic? Is he disguising himself? No. He's not like the thing he made. He makes the world to be inhabited by creatures with eyeballs. But he doesn't make himself at all. He's uncreated. And so he's not designed because no one designed him. He is who he is. And so he is not uh, created specifically for us because he's not created at all. So it uh, makes sense. He's invisible. That's just what he's like. He is not like his creation. He is powerful in ways that we are not. He is knowledgeable in ways that we are not. He is good in ways that we are not and can't be. The creation is not like him. There's no equal sign ever between God and what has been made. That's very important for us to remember as we move through the rest of the Bible. Second, we get the fall and hope. So these things end up coming together. Um, that there's the, the fall happens. This is when Adam and Eve sin uh, in Genesis chapter 3. And at the same time, we get a promise of hope. So you get the, the tragedy of humanity. God makes everything and he makes it good in the beginning. That's going to come into play later in some other sessions. Um, and then he creates us, calls us very good, and then he gives us a task. And he gives us a prohibition, a command. He says, you can have everything in the world except this. And they go in and they take it anyway. And don't get hung up on, well, was it an apple or a fig or what kind of fruit was it? That's not the point. The point of that, or why did God make, why did he put the tree right next to them if he didn't want them to eat from it? Like, again, the point of that is to show that humanity, left to ourselves, we will go after what we want and not what God wants. That we were created for God and to be in fellowship with God. Our inclination is to rebel against him. And that's what Adam and Eve do. They are enticed by the serpent and then go after what they want. To be like God rather than having, recognizing they're, they're not, they, they try to be the main characters. Like, oh, can we be the main character now? Great, we'll do that. Let's try that. It doesn't work. We, we're not designed to bear that weight. Only God is. This is where we get what the whole Bible is about. In Genesis 3.15, and if you've been here on any given Sunday, then you know Pastor Lewis loves to reference that text. So you should almost know it by heart by now. And that is where the uh, seed of the woman is said that he will come and he will crush the head of the serpent. He will deal with the sin problem. He will rid God's garden of invaders, of rebels. He will sort out what we broke. He will fix us and our sin and the wreckage we made of our peace and fellowship with God. And so everyone after Adam and Eve, though they are given this promise, it is in view to the rest of the Old Testament, but who they think it is keeps failing. So you have initially uh, the, the firstborn of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. You go, oh, maybe Cain's the guy. He's not the guy. <laughs> maybe Abel's the, oh, <laughs> the reason we know Cain's not the guy is, well, <laughs> okay, well, maybe it's Seth. Maybe he's the guy. He's not the guy. It's not him. He's not him. None of them are him. 
And over and over and over again, this is what happens. Maybe Noah's him. No. Well, what about some of the judges? What about Moses? No, not Moses. Moses even says, there will be one like me raised up from among you who will be greater than me. Okay, well, it's not Moses. Maybe David. Ooh, Bathsheba. Bad call. Maybe Solomon. He has a good track. Oh, 700 wives. Whoops. <laughs> so over and over again, you just keep, they, they, they fail. They fail and they fail. And notice how they're failing to crush this. The serpent never leaves us. It is ingrained into our nature, this temptation to try to play God, to have what is not ours, to rebel against him. It's, we're born with it. And, and we act according to those desires over and over and over again. And we keep taking from the tree that isn't ours. And over and over again, we keep looking for the Messiah as we read the Old Testament. And he doesn't come. And then eventually, we seem to despair. Like, is he ever coming at all? And that's when the prophets roll in. And they start talking about, well, this, hey, this dude's going to be born in Bethlehem of a virgin. Better look out for that. That's going to happen. And they start talking about this guy. He's going to bear our griefs and sorrows and our sins. And he's going to die. They're like, oh, wait, that's not how that's supposed to work. He's supposed to crush the serpent. Wait, what's going on there? Well, if you remember Genesis 3.15, this shouldn't surprise you. Because it says that the serpent will strike his heel, but he will crush his head. And if you picture it, it's almost as if in the, the act of striking the heel leads to the crushed head where the serpent grabs around his heel, well, now he's got the perfect positioning. Now he can just put his foot down, and it's over. And that's what we end up getting when Jesus arrives with redemption for us. And so while we in ourselves could not fix the problem, none of us had what it took to be the Messiah, God sends Jesus Christ, who is the better Adam, the second Adam, new man, who is able to come and crush the head of the serpent. He is the better King David, the better prophet, greater than Moses. He brings a new covenant with him where Moses brought a a covenant engraved in stone tablets. Jesus brings one and he engraves it upon human hearts. And then he suffers and he dies and he bears our grief and our sorrows and he takes them away as far as the east is from the west. He rises from the dead and ascends into heaven to rule and to reign. And he brings with him then the kingdom of God, the rule of God upon the earth. Because we screwed up. He, he delegated <laughs> to Adam, rule, this is yours. Take dominion over the earth. Well, we failed over and over and over. So he's like, I'll do it myself. And so Jesus comes and he rules and reigns over all things. And then even now, he is making new creations out of ruined sinners like us who have rebelled against our creator. He is taking those who rebel against him and turning them into his friends. He crushes his enemies by changing their hearts and turning them back to himself. So as we, we, if we look through this text, we, we can see all these pieces coming together. Verse 13, let's we'll go back through it. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness. Again, this, we all just are living in this wretched sin and in rebellion against God. And transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. In whom we have redemption, forgiveness of sins. God has to deal with our sin problem to bring us back to himself. And he does so through Jesus. And then the text that we've already read about who this Redeemer is. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Verse 17. He is also head of the body, the church. What's that about? Why is that suddenly? Again, he doesn't just save one person. He saves lots of people. And he gathers them together as his sheep. As, his, uh, as he is the great shepherd. And then he shepherds them through their lives. He guides them and teaches them and instructs instructs them in his wisdom so that they can build their houses upon the rock of his word so that they can live to God through him. He gives them grace to do so. It's not in your own strength that you learn wisdom from God's word. It is the spirit of God himself who instructs you from it. 
which is good news for us. And he's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. We'll talk about death in one of our last sessions and elaborate on that a good deal. But Jesus conquering death is a big deal. So that he himself will come to have first place in everything. So it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. If I had the time, I would regale you with tales of Gnosticism, what that is, and how that text refutes it, but we're not going to go there. Um, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Peace about what? Peace just generically? No. What was the problem? We were at war with God. And through Christ, we now can have peace through the blood of his cross, it required someone had to die to fix the problem. This is, again, the, the day that you eat of the tree, you will die. So when we all eat of our proverbial trees all the time, and we come into the world snatching and grabbing all that is and ours and trying to play God, well, someone has to die. And not just die in a generic sense, but die, die, be separated from God forever out of peace with him forever, suffering his wrath forever. But Jesus dies instead. He suffers that wrath. He pays the cost. And so he reconciles all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And so the, the blood of his cross not only makes peace between us on an individual level, but again brings us into this family of the church and also is the beginnings of a whole new creation. Because when Adam sins, all of the world falls in him, with him. He was given dominion over the earth, and so when he messes it all up, everything gets cursed, not just him. The ground that once brought forth good things now brings forth good things and some not-so-good things. I'm convinced that things like uh, cockroaches are the result of the fall. <laughs> Um, or at least their current behavior and stench um, is a result of the fall. Maybe they were once nice, and maybe they carried things. I don't know. Like, um, but not anymore. Things are out of order. They're not the way they should be. And, but Jesus is fixing it. He's reconciling all things to himself through the blood of his cross. And then Paul gets personal here at the end. And you, although you, were formerly, so he's assuming he's speaking to someone who is no longer, although you were formerly alienated, hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. One day Jesus will deal with all of your sin. He will rid you of it all. And then he adds this caveat. And this is not him saying that what is about to follow is how you earn your salvation. He's not saying that. But rather, if you have been reconciled to God through Christ, then it will show up in your life. It will bear that fruit. If you are rooted and grounded by the streams of living water, then it, you will grow. If you are under the sun, pun intended, uh, then you will grow and bear fruit. It is a result of who you now are, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven. So there you have it. We have then this gospel, this great good news, but again it has a context. It requires us to understand that we all suffer and are uh, co-committant in that first sin of Adam and Eve. That it is given to us through them, in a sense. And that we follow after those same desires. We behave in the same manner. We chase after our own wants. We make ourselves the main character, however you want to term it. Uh, well, the way the Bible does, we commit idolatry. We set other things up as God and we worship and serve that. The created thing. That's why, again, Genesis 1 explains so much. Why is God so upset that we are worshiping things that are, aren't Him? He didn't make us to do that. The creation was created as creation. It wasn't created to be worshipped and served. It was created to serve God. 
And so when we worship and serve the thing that was made to serve him, we're placing it above him. And it's out of order. So it gives us this structure that gives context to the good news. It gives us the family line of Jesus. It gives us that first proto-gospel in Genesis 3.15 where we see, okay, God's going to fix it. He's going to fix it through a man. And so we're supposed to look for him over and over and over. It never repeats that text in the rest of the Old Testament. It alludes to it, but never repeats it. But you're supposed to remember it. When you're reading over and over, remember that those people have Genesis 3 in their hands, for most of it anyway. They, they managed to lose the law at one point in the temple of all places, which shows you <laughs> um, they find it, thankfully, uh, later. But, uh, but, but for most of it, like, they have this. And they're looking for him. And they're looking for him, looking for him. And we live on the other side of that looking. We don't have to look too hard. He is set forth before us right here in the gospel in scripture. And so we are to respond to this news with faith. Not blind, just falling off a cliff because God told us to jump off a cliff. He's given us all of this, this whole story. It's set in that context. We don't have to blindly trust him because he's given us so many reasons to. His faithfulness to Israel, his faithfulness to Adam and Eve where he doesn't kill them. The day that they eat of it, they don't die. They die in one sense, but not in the other. But something does die. They're clothed in what? Animal skins? Where'd those come from? Somebody died that day. But it wasn't them. It was a substitute. There we have that picture. Someone has to die to reconcile God and man, and Jesus does. And so when we have that, we begin to understand it. Because if you walked up to somebody right now who's an atheist and didn't have a context for Christianity, and you go, Jesus died for you, they'd be like, well, why did he die? What? For me? How does that work? What's going on? You need context. That substitutionary sacrifice being pictured in the sacrifices of the temple over and over and over. In Abraham and Isaac, when he, Abraham says, get up, son, we're going to the mountain today to worship God. Where's the lamb, dad? God will provide. <laughs> and he does. He provides a ram in the thicket, and the angel has to intervene and stop Abraham's hand from bringing the knife down. And then you, it's interesting what you hear in Hebrews 11. Why did Abraham still try to bring the knife down? He believed that God would just raise Isaac from the dead. Okay. But again, but, but so Abraham believed in the resurrection of the dead? That means that he's got, he understands this, that that is the way out of our predicament. We need someone to die and rise from the dead. There it is. We see that gospel over and over and over again in the Old Testament, fulfilled in the New, and we live blessedly on the other side of it. And we can rejoice and be glad that we've got Bibles, Bibles everywhere that just have this good news upon, all, upon which all depends. The entire universe is made for this, hinges around it, all of history. You can picture it as this timeline. The gospel is in the center. And everything is leading up to it, and everything after is screaming back to it and saying, this is the point of why you exist. Why am I here? Ooh, big esoteric philosophy question. To glorify Jesus. Done. Easy. We can move on. <laughs> you have a degree in philosophy now. Congratulations. You answered all the hard questions. It's great. And that is what Christianity gives you. you. You can walk through life confident, knowing that all of your life is not about you. Your failures and your successes, your trials and your pain, and all of it is for the glory of Jesus Christ. And if you depend on his gospel, then you will be able to persevere and stand steadfast in the faith. And that hope that you receive through it and be with God, which is your purpose forever. All right. That's session two.